read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance Welcome back, lady listeners. Welcome back, lady listeners. I'm so excited. We have a brand new week and we have Lucy Eden with us. Friend of the podcast, three Peter. We've had her three (laughs) times now. This is it. She's brought us the book, The Art of Stealing His Heart. And I'm really excited to talk about it. It's got such a cute premise and it's such a cute story. I can't wait. I, I love Lucy. She is just she is the type of person I would describe as like vivacious. Like that's the only word I could describe her as because she's not only is she fun and energetic, but she has just got so much charisma. Like there's something about her where I just like want to be around her more when I'm around yeah. her. Or I'm like, she's just, she's like a magnet. And, you know, she's so fun, but vivacious. It almost sounds like a, a sophisticated bubbly Yes, it is. It's like a sexy, bubbly personality. I don't know what it is about her. But it, like I said, every time I'm in her presence, I just want to be there longer. She's such a sweet person. And she's so fun over emails. And one of the things I love that I put on here, and I don't know if you saw it when I sent it to you, was when I asked her if she wanted to do a giveaway. She said, ma'am, asking me if I want to do a giveaway is like asking me if I'm hungry. The answer is always yes. <laughs> I was like, I absolutely adore her. She's so fun. So we're going to talk about Lucy in just a few minutes and the art of stealing his heart. But before that, I wanted to talk about um, what we've been reading. And I have gone down a deep hole of these like mystery books that I was talking about last week. Mm -hmm. And I need to tell you how it ends. I just remembered. Oh, my God. I didn't tell you what happened at the end of the book that I was telling you about last time. Oh, yeah. You have to tell me after. I'll tell you after, but I started another one by her and it's so good. And I haven't gotten to the end of it yet. It's by Frieda McFadden. It's called, um, uh, no shit. It's not called, um, don't lie. That's not the name of it. It's something like, um, uh, not lie or something. It's not, it's not don't lie, but it's something like that. But um, I don't have my phone with me, so I can't look it up. But anyway, in the show notes for you guys. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Anyways, uh, by Freedom McFadden. And so it starts out and this girl is in the car with her new husband. They've been married six months and she's like going on and on about how great she is. And I'm immediately like, he's the killer. (laughs) 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 No no men are great in these books. And so she's like, we've been married six months and I didn't really know him a lot before then, but he's just so perfect. And I'm so happy. And I'm like, bitch, you're going to die. Like I'm two pages into this book and I'm like, you're going to get murdered. (laughs) But they go, they're going to see this house that's for sale and it's out in the middle of nowhere and they don't have good reception. They're supposed to be meeting their real estate agent there and there's like a snowstorm. And so they end up having to to like go to this house. They find it. They're like 10 minutes from the house that took them two hours to get there. So they're like, oh, we're almost here. Let's just go in and see it. And there's like spooky things that are happening in the house. They're like, have people been here? And this dude is just like gaslighting her the whole time. He's like, no, that that can't, that's us. Like that was from us. That's that wasn't here left previously. Or are you serious? Are you sure that was left there and not here? And it's like, I'm like, he is gaslighting her. He's going to kill her. She's going to die. So I don't know what's going to happen though. I'm like halfway through, but it like, the book starts out with this first chapter and then you go um, to the next chapter and it's in the past and it's about a, um, a psychologist and she's like interviewing patients and stuff. And she's written a book about um, traumatic events that have happened to her patients. And then um, you find out like in uh, again, it's in the beginning, you find out that the house is owned by this psychiatrist and she's gone missing and believed to have been murdered by her boyfriend. And so That's like, you're like, crazy. I know you're like, oh my God, what's happening? So it's really good so far. Um, so yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed these books. Like uh, I love a good mystery. I mean, it's interesting. I'm not even yeah. reading them. I'm like, what? Where's I know. Where? I'm like, they're, they're good twists that I usually don't like see coming. Yeah. And, um, but they're not like, they're not super hard to read. They're not really difficult plots. There's just always a good, like, <gasps> I didn't see that coming, you know, like there's always like a good gasp moment. And I think that's what, I think that's the, the tell of a great, uh, like suspense book 
is that you don't see the gas coming and yeah. it's very, very easy to read. It's not overly wordy. It's not super descriptive. There's not repetitive. It's just very, very easy reading. Like so the, the audios are great. I've been listening to all of them on audible. So, um, so yeah, so I can definitely recommend it again. Sorry. That's not a romance, but if you're looking for something kind of away from that, that's a good one to get into. So I've really enjoyed it. And then um, in the same vein, my um, other uh, like suspense thriller uh, detective series, the Angela Marsons book, book 20 comes out at the end of May. And I'm so excited that I am 20 books deep in this series. I have never in my life read a book series this long. No, I think my biggest, probably longest is like Black Brother Daggerhood. Yeah, Black Dagger Brotherhood. Yeah. Them. Right. You and I both. Books. We got like twelve books in that series. I know we both got deep in that mm -hmm. one. And then she Before, killed yeah. him. Mm -hmm. And then she said that she killed him because her dog died in real life. I know. And you were like, "That's it. I'm what? out." I don't know. I did Sticky Stab House pretty deep. Yeah, yeah. Those were a lot of books in that too. I, I quit if, her because I met her. Oh, Charlene Harris. That's right. Oh, I forgot about said, that. Because I don't think it's really a romance. That's the problem. Yeah. And when she, I, she was she talking kinda, about it and stuff, she was like kind of implying, she was like, I'll just keep writing and making stuff up as long as people keep reading it. So to me, it was like, okay, she doesn't even know who she's really going to end up with. So it kind of like, when she said that, it felt like the romance went out for me. I was like, yeah. oh, so we're just kind of like doing the world. Yeah. I yeah. love story. So it kind of left mm -hmm. that little magical part for me. I was like, damn it. Like I know. I remember that because we met her at RT. She was there at that one. And it was kind of the same where it was like, oh, I was in this series for the romance and you don't care about that yeah. at all. Like, but, you know, yeah. that's, I, you know, it might fluff some feathers to say this, but that's how I felt about the Outlander series. I really loved it in the beginning. I, you know, I watched the first season and stuff, too. And I was like head over heels and I'm like oh this is great and then I start to to hear some things and I looked it up and I was like oh yeah she doesn't really respect romance as a genre at all like that's not what she's in this for and like she would never consider her books romance books and I'm like but you built your entire empire off the backs of romance readers <laughs> like what what the fuck yeah. you know I know sometimes I don't know you start to read a series and it feels mm -hmm. like they're just fluffing it. I hate to say that. It sounds yeah, terrible, but you get to yeah. a point where I'm like, are we doing this? Are we just doing it to do it? Are we doing yeah. it because we love it? Yeah. Like we yeah. love this, the we love mm -hmm. the world. Yeah, and I think to I think the Diana Gabon, the the Outlander series, I can't remember how to say her last name, um, but the Outlander series, I think she loves the world, and I think she likes writing historical books like that. I think the romance is just not important to her, and yeah. it's in the books, but it's like she would be she would kill off a main character, and I don't think it would bother her necessarily to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what scared me about like going deep in the series where I was like, oh, she doesn't have a problem like killing off characters because she's not invested in the romance. And I'm like, dude, that's why I'm here, you know? Yeah. But no, I get it because I even felt like that with Fifty Shades of Grey, you know, where it was like, is she going to really go back and write all of the other ones from the other perspectives? I'm like, does she really want to do that? Or is this like a cash grab? Like. I think what? people wanted it because of the yeah because of the ending. Twilight one. Well, no, because of the ending of Fifty Shades, like oh, they, yeah, yeah, because it's from his point of view. Yeah, uh -huh, and yeah. people were like, "Oh my god!" But then some of my friends mm -hmm. read it and they're like, "Okay, I don't like some of his inner monologue. It kills kind of who he was for me." Yeah, that's what I heard too. Where it was like he ch and I didn't read it because I heard of that. Because it, it's not a spoiler. If you haven't mm -hmm. read the first one, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Um, I guess when he's with her, mm -hmm. with uh, Anastasia, mm -hmm. he tries to think of his last submissive. And he's yeah. like picturing her and shit. And I'm like, what? Get yeah, because he doesn't want to be attracted to her. I'm yeah, like, I don't want to read this. I no, know. Bye -bye. Yeah, that kind of really it for me. I will say, though, I did go back and read um, Midnight Sun, which is Twilight from Edward's perspective. I did read that. And yeah, I that actually, was I, it was really good. I'm glad I read it because you understand how obsessed he is with her. He is so in love with her. And I was just like, 
oh yeah, this reaffirms my addiction to this series. <laughs> like, okay, to this fandom. And then you end up hating her mom because you find out like how selfish she is and how like flippant she is about her daughter and like just is a kind of a bitch to everybody. Which I think is kind of cool because I think you read something and you make mm -hmm. the character your own, which is great when you get yeah. to read something. But then at the mm -hmm. same time, when you get something like that, you get to see how the author really sees them and you don't have yeah. to flush everything out. And you're like, oh, mm -hmm. that's why she did that. That's because it was in the author's head, but it's hard to get everything out. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. people are like, why was that like that? Or got mm -hmm. it. But the author had it there. It's just too much to flush. Yeah, exactly. It just wasn't enough time to delve into that. So you get to see it from that perspective. And I even think if you yeah. did, it would just be mm -hmm. too much at once. Mm -hmm. like but I will say, right. like, I do feel like as far as E.L. James and even Stephanie Meyer goes, I don't feel like either one of them did it for money. I really felt like it was like a, a love letter to their fans because yeah. their fans are the ones that demanded it for so long. And eventually they did do it. And it was like they didn't have to. They never yeah. have to write again, That's you know. True. And another great example of that is Jody Ellen Mobbles. I will say that woman is dedicated to her series. Like if you want an author that will die hard for her characters, yeah. that is that woman. I Absolutely. Agree. Heard this, the, this man trilogy is so good. I read them again. I listened to all the audios recently, like maybe about like six or eight months ago, I went back and I listened to, Oh, it was because, um, this man came out in his perspective. Yeah. So I went back and I listened yeah, to that book. Good. It was so good. It held up and it actually kind of made me like him a lot more. That's what those, I heard. Yeah, because he's like, he's a really mean hero in um in those books. And he's controlling and manipulative, but also in ways that are like kind of sexy possessive, <laughs> where he like hides her breath control pills over and over and over because he wants to get her pregnant. And I'm just saying that was hot, but. Um, but yeah, seeing it like from his perspective and learning the story and she absolutely wrote those books and still talks about those characters and will still release like, um, like it's side so chapters tall. and stuff. Some, and some authors can write men mm -hmm. really well. And maybe that's yeah. what the, the James things mm -hmm. miss. Maybe she's not, cause she wrote all in her, in yeah, her from in a too, and I know I'm not good at writing a man. But you're great at writing a man. I feel like Jody definitely is. For she sure. Yeah, person. she nailed it. So I can it. look at her and talk to her and be like, mm -hmm. she could write a man. Oh, she's got it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And most I of her series, I think, are dual POVs. And that's and it serves her well mm -hmm. that she does that because she writes such great heroes. Very strong, super possessive. Like, But, you know, in Jody's books, the reason I don't always rush to get them is because there's usually something in the book that I know that's going to take me on an emotional journey. Yeah. And I'm usually afraid of that. Where yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, like this something you know bad really it, happens. Yeah. But it's gonna, it's gonna, but it's gonna hurt. hurt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Where I'm like, I'm not as likely to go on that. But you know, and the same thread is that as well as Jody is Kennedy Ryan. The same thing with her books. I know I'm gonna I know I'm gonna read them. I'm gonna love them. They're gonna alter my soul, but they're gonna hurt. Yeah. And it's like I know I can't just pick up one of those. It's not a light read. You know, it's something I have to be really intentional about, but I, I save her books and then I savor them, you yeah, know, for sure. So I think that's the difference in like those, those initial like sweet, fun, fluffies. And then these where you dig deeper into the emotions and that kind of thing. So, so yeah, so it, it just all those experiences one, but, uh, but yeah, just wanted to mention those books too, while we got on that subject. But um, I also went back and, um, and and the reason I think all this is on my mind as well is my husband was out of town this weekend with Lydia. They went um, and did some landscaping at my in-laws house and stuff. And I couldn't help because my shoulders fucked up. So I stayed home with all the animals and my little one. So um, anyways, I stayed home. I had the TV to myself for like two whole days. And I was like, what the fuck am I going to do? And for some reason, I was like, I'm going to watch the Divergent movies. It was like a recommendation on Amazon. They were free. And I was like, I'm just going to put these on. I never watched them. I never read the books. I don't know why I didn't get into that series because I was heavy into Twilight. And I love the Hunger Games. Both of those were great. And it came out around the same time. So for whatever reason, 
I didn't like get into them, but I watched all three movies and I really liked them. I was like, these are great. The love story in it, I thought was far superior than, than the Hunger Games. Because in the Hunger Games, you have a, a love triangle. And even in the, the last movie of the Hunger Games, it's a trilogy book, but it's a four-part movie. Um, the last uh, part two of the third movie, um, it is like, it's just devastating. And it's sad and heavy. And it's not like, it's, you know, there's not really any of that sweet, innocent love anymore because she's a changed person. And I understand yeah. it. But I will say the difference for me in the Divergent series was that the main hero in that, Tris, she and the the hero four, like they have such an amazing connection. They grow together. Yes. And like he's just super devoted to her, like always there to like, you know, support her and love her. And he's just very steady and unconditional. And I just love that about him, about how he trusts her and he trusts our judgment, even though like he's older and more experienced, he just defers to her in a lot of ways. And I love that, that there was strength in that for me and watching their love story. But um, I posted about it in the Read Me Romance headquarters in our Facebook group. And I was like, hey, did anybody ever read the Divergent books? I never did. But is the love story explored more in the books? Because I might be willing to read the books mm -hmm. if I get more of that love story. Because it was great. And every, almost every single po person that posted, like 99%, they were like, don't read it. Don't <laughs> read it. Because I didn't realize this. The author wrote the three books. And then she came out with a fourth book later. But it was like years later, I think. But in the three books, the third book has a very different ending than the movies. And they were like, the movie actually, like, I think when the third book came out, people lost their fucking minds. Mm -hmm. And the people that did the movie changed it in yeah. the movie. That did you sense. know? Did you know about no, the, what happened? Okay, about this is a spoiler. All right, so if you don't want to know what mm -hmm. happens at the end of the Divergent movies or the books, get out now. Okay, that was your opportunity. Um, so apparently, in the in the movie, they like fight this big bad guy, and there's like all this stuff that happens and everything. Um, the city kind of like the society sort of crumbles, but there's hope in that the, whatever they're going to build next is going to be great. In the books. In the third book, she fucking kills off the heroine. Fucking kills her in the last of it. And I was like, what? When I looked at this spoiler and I saw this, the author was like, it's been like 10 years since I did this, since I killed off Tris and the world hated me. And she was like, but I wouldn't change a thing. And she was like, and we're like, we're, us hating you isn't changing either. <laughs> I was like, good, because everybody's still mad at you. <laughs> right? Go ahead and keep dying on that hill. Oh, and she was just like, no, there was supposed to be, she was like, you're supposed to be left with the sadness of the hero and leaving and then how they impacted everyone else around them and how that's going to change the world. I'm like, you think I give a fuck about that world? That's you think that's what I care about. It was her that I cared about. Her I was invested in. And you killed her off. I don't give a fuck if they all burn and die. Like that's how I feel. She was the good in humanity, and then yes. you killed her. And I can't imagine that. Like I can't imagine reading these books one at a time, waiting for them to come out. As desperate as people were for them, and as great as the book as the movies were, I cannot imagine how great, great the books books. were. You know what? Has she wrote any more books? I think she's written a couple since then, yeah, but like standalones, they're not in the world at all. I have no idea how they've done. I, I have no like, desire. Oh, I'm never coming back. I'm yeah, so, I would I'm have so no sorry. desire to read them based on that alone. I would I'm never read them. You. I'm like, bitch, I'm scared. I'm yeah, I wouldn't there. trust her after that. So, okay, spoilers <laughs> over. Sorry. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> no more spoilers on it. But yeah, that was, that was intense. So I watched all three of those movies. And then I went back and I had gotten for Christmas I had gotten the movie. I don't know if you remember the movie Legend, where Tim yeah. Curry's the devil. Did yeah. we talk about that? Uh, yeah, where Tim Curry's like the big devil with the horns and he's red. Tom Cruise is in it. The girl from Ferris Bueller's Day Off is the princess in it. It's from the 80s. I don't know if you remember that one or not. I think I remember it. I okay, know. that was that was what I like to call that movie was my sexual awakening because Tim Curry was the devil in that and I was so attracted to him that I did not understand what that was <laughs> while I was turned on. So because he's like he's so he's supposed to be like, you know, evil in this, but he's so tempted by her that he's willing to like 
you know, give her anything she wants, do whatever, because he's just obsessed with her. And I liked that level of worship. And I think that's why I write the romances I do now. Because of that. <laughs> but anyways, I got that DVD for Christmas because it had like uh, the director's cut on it with director's commentary. So I went back and I watched that like while they were gone, like I put in that DVD and got to listen to the, I watched it with the director talking the whole time. It was fantastic. And it was a Ridley Scott movie. So it was really cool to hear Ridley Scott describe it. But, um, and then I ended up watching two movies that I had saved on Netflix, both of which were kind of like emotional tear jerkers. One's called Good Grief, where it has the guy from Schitt's Creek in it. Um, I cannot remember. Um, not Eugene Kelly. It's his son, Eugene Levy. Uh, someone's screaming at me. The Ooh David guy. You know, did you ever watch Shit's Creek? I never watched it, but it's the it's the guy from that. He's got really dark hair and like thick eyebrows. Anyways, so he's in this movie. It's called Good Grief on Netflix. It is about him and he's married and his partner dies. And it's the, the anniversary of his partner's death. And it's about him and his friends have like the like one of the quotes. And I think in the trailer is his um, one of his close friends. She says, look, we've we've sat on you for a year. OK, we like nested you and comforted you and sat on you. It's time for you to leave the nest. right? <laughs> like that's kind of what she's saying. But there's a kind of a good twist in it, too, that I didn't see coming. Um, with the husband and everything that happens. And um, it ended up being emotional in ways I didn't expect. It was really like hopeful and sweet. And I loved it. And um, I watched that. And then I was telling you earlier, I watched Naya, the one with Jodie Foster and Annette Benning in it um, about the swimmer. And that one was actually, I thought it was going to be like one of those like athlete hero, like that's why I'm crying moments, but it was actually really informative because they talked about um, just sort of, uh, but it's about Nyad, how she's a swimmer. She was the first one, the first person ever to swim from Cuba to Florida without the assistance of a cage, like a shark cage or anything like that. She just did it on her own. So it was really um, a lot of kind of the history of it, of how it happened. She attempted it for the first time, I think, in 1973 and then didn't do it again until like 2003 when she was 60 years old, I think. So legal? do what? Can you swim to Cuba in 2003? Yeah, she swam from Cuba to Florida. Yeah, yeah, she did. Mm -hmm. So it was, I think it was 2003. I think that was the year she started to get, she turned 60 though. And then she just decided I'm going to do this because she failed the first time she tried in like 1978. But um, she was like a, she was an Olympic swimmer, I believe before that. So, but yeah, she did it at 60 years old. I could not freaking believe it. It was so cool. And Jodie uh, Foster was her um, coach in it who just, she looked phenomenal in that role. <laughs> How terrible is it when I was thinking about it? Like swimming there. I'm a pretty strong swimmer. I can tread mm -hmm. water for a long time, but I'm thinking, yeah. I was like, I could never make it because I would get really hungry. Oh, they feed her while she does it. Okay. It was like, oh yeah, it was like 50, I think it was like 58 hours or 70 hours. I was going to say, I was like, I. Because I can lay on my back and even I can lay on my back and sunbathe in water and go. Not sleep. Of like sleep. You have to go almost two, no, that's almost three days without sleep. With you can not sleep sleeping. In, you can go on your back and sleep in the no, water. No, not like that. You can't just go to sleep. They can't give you any assistance. Nobody can touch you. You can't touch the boat. Like you're in the water alone. They can they have the boat beside her. I feel like I napped in water on my back. I mean, maybe you could if you floated, but you're trying to get there as fast as you can. Oh, I didn't say you would play. stop for like a, an hour like break. Like I'm just going to mm -hmm. chill, float. I think, she attempts it. I think she attempts it four, three or four times before she eventually makes it. But, um, but yeah, it's like, they have to like squirt, um, like food in her mouth and stuff and water like at a distance because like they can't touch her. They can't risk her touching the boat or anything know, like that. I mean, you go to the pool for two hours, you're starving. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they're saying. They were like, we have to feed her. It's like every 40 or 90 minutes or something. We have to feed her or her body will start eating itself. Yeah. They were like, she needs thousands and thousands of calories every like few hours or something. I was like, shit. 
But it's like by the time she makes it, she's like delirious. Like she's hallucinating because she's been so many days without sleep. And it's like being in the salt water that long, ingesting salt water, and your and her eyes are swollen and like think about blisters. Salt water and the lack of sleep. Yeah, and it's like the blisters all over her skin and everything from the sun. And it's like, oh. And they were like, she's fighting off sharks and jellyfish and all this shit. Like, it's wild. It's a crazy story. You should watch a movie because it's not like, it wasn't like a crying, sobbing movie. I didn't feel like that at all. It was actually just really fucking cool. Yeah. And I didn't realize, like, Naya, you know, obviously it's based on a true story. The actual person, she was a victim of sexual assault from one of her coaches and she was like really vocal about it in the seventies and eighties and like went on like talk shows and talking about like what happened. And she like, in part of the movie, um, this, I mean, it's a little spoiler, I guess, but in part of the movie of uh, the person that uh, did the assault, he died. And she was really upset that like, he still like had all like, I guess he still kept all of his like medals and rankings and titles and stuff. Even, even though, I mean, this was back when it, I mean, this was back when she did it. I mean, this would have been like 10, 20 years ago. I don't know. I can't, I don't know what year it was she did. Maybe it was 2013 and I'm not remembering that date, right? It's not that long ago that she did it and that she, that she completed and that this guy died and he still had all his accolades. And I think that was something that she was really fucking pissed about. And even though she was so vocal about it, you know, later in life, like when she came forward and then other people came forward and stuff. So, again, it's just it's a really good story just about like perseverance. I mean, it just really like it made me feel good watching it. It wasn't something I kind of was afraid to watch it for a while because, again, like that emotional like yeah. journey. But no, it was it was fantastic. And it's such a great movie about friendship. Just incredible friendship. So yeah, yeah. definitely okay. worth a watch if you haven't. So. You know what that made me think of, sadly, mm -hmm. with your sexual assault story? Yeah. Was what? I seen a TikTok the other day and I thought it was really interesting how she kind of checked the guy. It was a stupid thing where she was like, Would you leave your daughter in the woods with a man? Or with a bear. Yep. I've seen that one. Yep. And then when mm -hmm. he was like wailing, weighing it back and forth, and she goes, you know that feeling you fear, you feel right now about mm -hmm. leaving your daughter in the water, uh, in the woods with a man? That's mm -hmm. how women feel when they're walking to their car at night. That yep. feeling you have inside you right now. Mm -hmm. They feel that every time they walk to their car. I was like, oh. And his eyes like kind of get big like, oh, shit. Yeah. When it's like, then I, I've seen the one where they ask women that. And it's like they're asked like. They'll, they'll do clips and it's like 20 women. Would you rather be, um, would you rather be lost in the woods with a bear or a man? And every woman's like bear, 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 bear. Every single woman says bear because yeah. they're like that. And they were like, men, does this tell you anything that we would rather be lost in the woods with a bear that could kill us than you? <laughs> it was just like, yeah, yeah. Fair point. I feel like I can climb away from a bear. Mm -hmm. I could, they were, like, they were like, a bear's not always going to attack you. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, if I buy my business, are, you know, hold my his business. Uh, exactly. <laughs> they were like, the odds of a bear attacking me are lower than you. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, true. That's fucked up, right? Like, I feel like we're going to go into this woods. There's a bunch of bears. Or we can take all the bears out. And there's going to be one man. I'm like, leave the bears. Leave the bears. <laughs> leave, leave them all there. They're good. <laughs> This is why we like romance, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. We have to write a bear romance next. <laughs> Let's talk about Lucy Eden. Let's talk about her. All right. So, Lucy has brought us the book, The Art of Stealing His Heart. And if you don't know, Lucy Eden is the nom de plume of a romance obsessed author who writes the kind of romance she loves to read. She's a sucker for alphas with a gooey, soft center. Over-the-top romantic gestures, strong and smart, smart main characters, humor, love at first sight, or pretty damn close, happily ever afters, and of course, dirty and steamy love scenes. When Lucy isn't writing, she's busy reading or listening to every book she can get her hands on, romance or otherwise. She lives and loves in New York with her husband, two children, a turtle, and a Yorkshire terrier. I love it. So the book you're about to listen to today, The Art of Stealing His Heart. Uh, at 28, Trevor Edwards had thought he'd conquer the world. He had massive success in the art and corporate worlds, a happy marriage, and two gorgeous children. 
Then illness took his wife, and in her, he lost the mother of his children, his best part, his business partner, and his best friend. He spent the next five years drifting through life, unknowingly searching for someone to fill the hole in his heart. Gia Wesley was struggling was a struggling art student. She always held hope in her heart for a love that she wasn't sure existed. But a job interview with a reclusive widower ch can change everything. Get wrapped up in this syrupy, sweet, hot and steamy roller coaster ride of true love and second chances. This standalone novella has an obsessed alpha, love at first sight, safe, no cheating with a guaranteed happily ever after. Please enjoy in a cozy corner of your favorite art museum. I think that's so cute. The Art of Stealing His Heart is a standalone, but Lucy Eden has a not-so-secret pen name with a six-book series of tropey novellas starring Cinnamon Roll, sorry, starring six Cinnamon Roll brothers. It's called The Heart of Stone series by Eden Weber. They're all in Kindle Unlimited. Um, book one is the Heart of the Stone series. Book one in the Heart of the Stone series is called Up in the Air, and you can get it for free. So check out Up in the Air by, um, hold up, by, wait, what did I say on that? Oh, by Eden Weber. I'm so sorry. I like lost track of where I was at. Um, so yeah, grab book one in the series Up in the Air by Eden Weber. It's free right now. Um, and then Lucy Eden's big news is she has her debut um, book from a traditional publisher. It's by Forever Publishing. So this is really exciting. Um, it's up for pre-order right now. It'll be live on November 12th. So go check it out. We'll have the links and she's got it all up there. Um, it's called Love and Bloom, which I absolutely adore. So it's really cute. It says, in this hilarious, uh, steamy rom-com, a hardworking city woman unexpectedly inherits her grandparents' farm that comes equipped with a handsome horticulturist. And I was like, I love it. I think that's so cute. And um, her giveaway this week, which she said, uh, ask if she wants to do a giveaway, is like asking if she's hungry. The answer is yes. <laughs> um, she said that she's going to do a um, she's going to do a surprise sign book and a swag box, which you have got to get her swag box. If you see them when she posts them up, you have got to get one. I think it's the Love Notes from Paradise book box she does. They are always so freaking pretty. She has the best special editions of books, and she does them for other authors as well. Um, she, Everything she touches with, like her swag, book boxes, all of that is just fantastic. 10 out of 10. Um, if you want to know where you can get stuff from her, like her swag and things like that. Oh, I saw her at Book Bonanza last year. She had these specialized uh, coloring books made where she went and put a page for every author that was there and put it in there and had those at her table, which I thought was really freaking cool. And so um, I know she's going to have just the best swag, too. She'll probably I think she's there again this year, but she has it on her website. She said, if you want to check out any of the signings she'll be at, it's Lucy, L-U-C-Y, Eden, E-D-E-N dot com. And you can find her everywhere on social media at Lucy Eden author. So make sure you check all that out and you can see just everything she's got, which is amazing. You should follow her. You should. <laughs> all right. Let's sit them in. Let's do it. We'll see you guys on the other side. Bye. This is The Art of Stealing His Heart by Lucy Eden. Read for you by Ramona Master. Every story is for my mom who made me fall in love with reading, and Miss Kay, who made me fall in love with writing. Gaia Okay, Gaia, you got this. Just breathe. It's just another job interview. You had jobs before. I thought my pep talk was going well, until I stumbled on a crack in the sidewalk and almost busted my ass on the concrete. If I couldn't walk down the street without falling over, how was I going to convince some rich guy to let me take care of his children? I've never been a nanny before, but I've always loved children. I used to teach art classes at my local summer camp when I was a teenager. I've spent plenty of weekends babysitting to save money for art supplies, but spending a few hours a day with kids wasn't the same as being a full-time caregiver and not my area of expertise. I'm an artist, 
well, currently an art student. My professor and mentor recommended me for a job as a nanny for one of her friends. She knew I could use the money, and I was grateful for the opportunity. Plus, Professor Swenson wasn't the type of woman you said no to, especially since she'd been so helpful to me while in school. I threw on what I hoped looked professional. A crisp white blouse, a black pencil skirt, and a pair of black leather pumps. I tamed my waist-length brown hair into a feasibly polished-looking bun and traded my usual contacts for my glasses to complete the ensemble. I arrived with ten minutes to spare and rang the door of a large townhouse in the historic district of the city. A severe-looking man in his sixties wearing a three-piece suit opened the door. Miss Wesley, he said before I had the chance to open my mouth. It was a statement, not a question. Mr. Edwards is expecting you right this way. Mr. Edwards, I thought to myself, and at that very moment realized that I did zero research on my possible future employer. I didn't even know his name. As I followed my guide through the house, I desperately studied my surroundings, hoping to learn something, anything about the family that was about to trust me with their children, possibly. Or child. I didn't know. The house was impeccably decorated, but surprisingly colorful. And whoever Mr. Edwards was, he had fantastic taste in art. The walls were adorned with an eclectic mix of classic and contemporary pieces, including works by Basquiat, Herring, what I would swear was an actual Monet. And sitting on a small table in one of the many sitting rooms was what looked like a Kusama pumpkin. How in the world would someone get a Kusama pumpkin for their house? Then it hit me. Mr. Edwards, the large townhouse, and the extensive collection of priceless art, both contemporary and classic. This was the home of Trevor Edwards. Trevor Edwards. I was sitting in the office of Trevor Edwards. It was no wonder Professor Swenson didn't bother to mention the name of the person who wanted to hire me. I probably would have been too nervous to show up. Trevor Edwards was the founder and CEO of Pax Industries. I know it's a multinational diverse company, but what Trevor Edwards is known for, what I know him for, is that he is famous for being a patron of the arts. It's where his fortune began. He has a talent for seeing the beauty and potential in works of art and artists, and turning it into millions of dollars. The story was, and I'm not sure if this is right, but it's pretty damn cool, that as an art student, he found a Rembrandt at a yard sale, purchased it for 40 bucks, restored it himself, and sold it at auction for $4 million. He used the money to start PAX as an auction house, and the rest is history. And now, here I sit in the same room, potentially interviewing to be his nanny. I wondered if it was too late to run out of the room. But my guide, whom I learned was named Frederick, closed the door behind him as he left. So, Gaia, he was reading my resume. I didn't even remember handing it to him. But I must have, because it was no longer in my hand. Yeah, Gaia, I stammered. It's the Earth Goddess. My parents were hippies. I laughed nervously. I'm familiar. So are you a fan of Gaia? His face was inquisitive, but I couldn't read his expression. What I did know was that he was the sexiest man I'd ever seen. The rare photo appeared in the paper or on the news, but nothing compared to seeing the real Trevor Edwards up close and in person. This man was gorgeous. He was in his early 30s, with a ruggedly handsome boyish face and sparkling green eyes. His six-foot-tall frame was perfected with a broad chest and well-defined muscles. A suit jacket and tie had been draped over a nearby chair, showcasing the crisp powder blue dress shirt. The top two buttons were undone, and the sleeves were rolled up. I imagined him scooping me up in his big, strong arms, 
laying me across his desk and doing things to my body that I'd only seen on clandestine websites while curled up in bed late at night listening to my roommate snore. My inappropriate daydream was cut short when I realized that he'd been staring at me expectantly. Shit, he'd asked me a question. I was so entranced in his emerald eyes, I hadn't bothered to answer. What was it? All of my energy was focused on trying to rewind the last few seconds of my meeting. I was pretty sure it was something about my name. Um, the Earth Goddess? I blurted out, wondering how much time had passed since he asked the question. Yeah, I guess I'm a fan of the Earth. I trailed off, looking down at my hands folding in my lap, feeling like an idiot. Had I just told Trevor Edwards I was a fan of the Earth? I struggled with the feeling of simultaneously wanting to run out of this townhouse and never look back, coupled with not wanting to embarrass Professor Swenson. The latter was the smart option, and I stayed in my seat. When I forced myself to look at him, I saw he was smiling. He had the most gorgeous smile I'd ever seen on a man with dimples. When he smiled at me, he smiled with his eyes. I was referring to Gaia the artist, he replied, obviously struggling to stifle a little laugh. Of course he meant that Gaia, the other Gaia. I wanted to sink into my chair and disappear. I'm a big fan, I started nervously. I love the way he uses iconic figures and themes and incorporates them into modern urban landscapes. He's a hack, he cut me off. Tired, overdone. He's just a, excuse me, I interrupted, no longer embarrassed. The rest of the exchange was a blur but I remembered having a heated debate about the future of modern art and place of street artists in the hierarchy. When I regained my composure enough to remember that I was supposed to be in a professional setting, I managed to thank Mr. Edwards for the interview, hoping it was enough to save face with my professor. As I stood on the stoop of the townhouse, after Frederick saw me out, I knew three things for sure. I would not be getting the job as the nanny, I'd just engaged in a shouting match with one of the most important people in the art world, and that I was incredibly attracted to him. Which was the most upsetting thing of all? Trevor. When my longtime colleague and friend, Victoria Swenson, recommended that I hire one of her students to help me care for my children, I was quite resistant to the idea. It had been five years since I'd lost my wife, and the thought of putting myself through the hiring process for something so intimate as childcare was not an idea I relished. Olivia had hired our children's first nanny. Mrs. Bast had remained with us for years. She cared for us during Olivia's illness and guided the children and me through our grief. Six months ago, she decided to retire to move to the Midwest to live with her daughter and grandchildren. Naturally, Liam and Eloise were devastated. I was beside myself. Losing Edna would be like losing Olivia all over again. She had handpicked Edna Bast from dozens of applicants, and she was the only mother figure the children had known. How could I possibly hope to replace her? Running a billion-dollar corporation was easy. There was no emotion involved. I could hire and fire at will. But choosing a person to help raise your children without input from their mother, whom they'd barely known, was quite another story. I offered Mrs. Bast an embarrassing amount of money to stay on, but she refused, insisting that I was ready and was perfectly capable of finding the right person. She specifically said the word person not Nanny. When Frederick led Miss Wesley into my study, I wasn't sure what I was expecting, but it wasn't her. For starters, she was beautiful. Possibly one of the most beautiful women I'd ever seen. She was dressed demurely, but I could instantly tell it was a facade. She gave the impression of a young woman trying to appear older and more sophisticated. But when she fixed her eyes on me, I sensed something of a wild, untamed spirit. 
Her gaze awakened something inside me. And I wanted nothing more at that moment than to know more. An embarrassing large erection strained against my zipper as I imagined crossing the room in long strides, ripping her blouse open, sending buttons scattering across the floor and burying my face in the soft, fragrant skin of her breasts. I hadn't felt this in five years, and it was confusing. I pushed it out of my mind and focused on the task at hand. I dismissed Frederick, took a seat at my desk to hide my massive erection, and motioned for Miss Wesley to sit. I had asked Victoria not to reveal my identity to her prospect. The last thing I needed was a sycophantic art student intent on using the position to gain leverage in the art world. Nevertheless, I could immediately tell by this woman's expression that she'd worked out who I was. Absent from her face was the usual opportunistic hunger that the women I'd come in contact with over the years unsuccessfully tried to hide in the presence of a single grieving billionaire with two young children. The look on Ms. Wesley's face told me she wanted nothing from me. And in that moment, I wanted to give her everything. It had been two days since my interview with Gaia Wesley, and she's occupied every waking moment. She was beautiful, intelligent, and she ignited a fire in me that I had long thought extinguished. If any other person would have spoken to me the way she did, they would have lived to regret it. But I wanted to punish my little goddess by grabbing her, tearing her clothes off, and fucking her until she screams my name, begging for more. I also wanted more. I wanted her, all of her. I wanted to possess her, keep her, hold her in my arms and never let go. She was the first person I encountered in years that wasn't interested in my money or connections and wasn't afraid to challenge me if she didn't agree with my opinions. I didn't know how much I needed that until I'd insulted the artist who shared her name. Her iridescent blue eyes flashed. And at that moment, I was gone. I was hers. And she needed to be mine. Daddy! I heard a high-pitched squeal from outside my study, where I'd apparently been spending too much time staring at an empty chair. Her chair. Come on, we gotta leave now, or we're gonna be late! It was Eloise, my six-year-old daughter, and the only person who could tear me away from my tortured thoughts. Besides Liam, her eight-year-old brother. They were dressed up, Liam in a miniature version of the tuxedo I was wearing. But he insisted on a bow tie that was covered in cartoon whips as a nod to his favorite superhero. And Eloise looked perfect in a pink confection, covered in rhinestones and matching bow for her dark auburn curls. Auntie Victoria is waiting for us. Now let's go. Yes, ma'am, I chuckled. And we climbed into the car and headed to the opening of a new gallery across town. As we pulled in front, there was already a crowd of photographers. We exited the cars, and the kids, spotting Victoria, scrambled out of the car screaming, Auntie Victoria! Check out this sweet bow tie. Do you like my dress? Watch me twirl. You two look amazing, she beamed. Let's go inside. There's a chocolate fountain. Two sets of little eyes lit up and raced for the door. We followed them inside. Daddy, can we go get some chocolate? Yes, Liam, just keep an eye on your sister and stay where I can see you. Aren't you going to tell him not to get his tux dirty? Victoria smirked. Hell no. What if someone told an eight-year-old Jackson Pollock to keep his clothes clean? She smiled at that and turned to face me. So how was your interview? Isn't Gaia great? I rounded on her. What on earth were you thinking sending that girl to my house? You should have seen the way she conducted herself. She blew up at me because I insulted an artist she liked. Hmm, sounds like someone I know. I would never act that way in a professional setting. She shot me a look that said, really? I pretended not to see it. I've never seen anything like it, Vic. So? She inquired, still smirking. 
You liked her that much? What exactly are you? I stopped mid-sentence. I saw Liam a few feet away, completely engrossed in the chocolate fountain. But no sign of the cotton candy pink dress and bouncing brown curls. Do you see Eloise? Victoria shook her head, her eyes scanning the crowd. Liam, I called quickly, closing the distance between us, with Victoria close behind. Where is your sister? Liam, who was in the process of sliding a giant chocolate-covered marshmallow in his mouth, looked around frantically, then up at me and shrugged. I'll check the bathroom, Victoria called over her shoulder, already in transit. I called the head of security, who was a few feet away. I need you to cover all exits and keep an eye on my son, I gestured to Liam. We're looking for a little girl in a pink dress. Yes, sir. He started barking into a radio attached to his jacket as he followed me around the gallery. I had a feeling I knew where she was headed. For a six-year-old, Eloise had forgotten more about art than I had ever learned by the time I was her age. She also had an innate talent for recognizing good art, something she inherited from her mother. We were only searching for a matter of seconds, when I spotted what looked like a large puff of cotton candy with feet and a taller woman in a black dress, both with waist-length chestnut hair. They had their backs turned to me, and they were standing in front of an oil painting of a woman sleeping. Eloise was talking animatedly with the stranger, pointing at different aspects of the painting. The head of security approached me to speak, and I quickly held a finger to my lips and nodded in his direction. He nodded back and whispered into his shoulder, we got her original positions, everyone, before backing out of sight and disappearing around the corner. I turned my full attention to the pair admiring one of Henri Matisse's most famous paintings on loan from Madrid. It's his daughter, continued Eloise, unaware she was being observed. Her name is Marjorie, I think. Marguerite, the mystery woman, and I said in unison, Eloise whipped around at the sound of my voice. Her face lit up like a Christmas tree. Daddy! She ran and jumped into my arms. Eloise. I squeezed her tight, trying to squeeze the last terrifying three minutes out of my mind. I thought I told you to stay where I could see you. I'm sorry, Daddy, but I wanted to see the sleeping lady again. And look, I made a new friend. I looked up and in the direction that Eloise was eagerly pointing. I was face to face with Gaia Wesley. Gaia. Her name is Gaia, Daddy, my new little friend said excitedly. I was frozen, rooted to the spot. I'd come to interview at his house and instead insulted him. Now he finds me with his daughter, who had apparently been missing. Despite my shock and embarrassment, I still couldn't help noticing how sexy he looked in his perfectly tailored tuxedo. It was as if he'd just stepped out of a spy movie. The way he was so tender and loving to little Eloise made me feel like I would collapse if I didn't sit down soon. Same as the guy you like that paints on buildings. I snapped to attention. I tilted my head and narrowed my eyes at him. He was a fan of Gaia after he allowed me to rant and rave in his study like a crazy person. He returned my gaze with a raised eyebrow and mischievous grin. I was both turned on and furious, but I still couldn't bring myself to speak. After what felt like several long minutes locking eyes with Trevor Edwards, but was more likely 30 seconds, he turned his attention to Eloise. Darling, would you like to visit the chocolate fountain? She nodded furiously, grinning. She was missing a front tooth. It made her even more adorable. This nice lady, he motioned to a nearby security guard, will take you to Auntie Victoria, and I'm going to talk to your new friend. Sir, I'm supposed to guard the painting. I can't. Oh, I'm sure she'll be all right for a few minutes. He motioned to the eternally slumbering Marguerite. Dr. Victoria Swenson. He gave her a stern look. She withered under his gaze, nodded, and smiling at Eloise, took her hand and disappeared around the corner. I was alone with him again. Now, Miss Wesley, he rounded on me. 
I felt his eyes burrowing into me, devouring every inch of my body. I felt naked, vulnerable, and, oddly, safe. What am I going to do with you? You're a fan of Gaia. After you... In an instant, he closed the distance between us and pressed a finger against my lips, silencing me. It was the first time he'd touched me, and I felt a jolt of electricity course through my body. I felt his arms slide across the small of my back, encircling my waist. He pulled me close, and I could feel every muscle and sinew of his body against mine. He slowly withdrew his finger, and I could feel the heat of his lips, mere inches from my own. His eyes met mine, and I was silently pleading for him to kiss me. The anticipation was killing me, and he seemed to be enjoying the effect. He slid the hand that wasn't, keeping me pressed against him around my small round ass, and slipped a middle finger between my cheeks, all while maintaining the intense eye contact that kept me his silent prisoner. He continued exploring until he found the wetness between my thighs, already slick with juices. His roving finger slid easily between my outer lips, and he growled in my ear. So wet. So ready, he said. I felt my breath quicken. And now I was panting with desire. He slowly slid his middle finger inside my throbbing entrance and used his thumb to rub my clit in slow, rhythmic circles. I felt my hips begin to rock in motion with his hand and felt my climax building in waves. He stopped suddenly, and I could feel him backing away, his arms slowly sliding across my back, releasing me. It's okay, I pleaded. I want you to. He silenced me again with his finger. I know you are, and I will. He hooked a finger under my chin, tilting my head upward until our eyes met. But not here, not like this. I'm sure my disappointment was apparent because he gave me a devilish grin and began to trail kisses down my neck, down my chest where he playfully bit at one of my nipples. I gasped at the shock waves his touch was sending through every inch of my aching body. He was now on his knees. The most unattainable billionaire bachelor in the world was kneeling in front of me, wearing a tuxedo that probably cost more than my car. He was hooking his thumbs into the size of my panties and sliding them down my legs, carefully lifting one, then the other, before bringing my panties to his nose and closing his eyes as he inhaled the fragrance that he created with one smoldering look. I watched him carefully tuck my black lace panties into the pocket of his tuxedo jacket. Then he gave me one last devilish smirk before his entire head disappeared under my skirt. The next sensation I felt was his tongue parting my outer lips, and sliding over my sensitive nub, sending waves of pleasure through my entire body. Overcome by desire, my knees buckled. I didn't know how I would be able to stand. In one smooth motion, Trevor grabbed my thighs and hoisted me onto his shoulders, supporting my full weight and granting his mouth full access to my wanting sex. I leaned back against the wall succumbing to the pleasure as Trevor Edwards explored me with his tongue. My legs jerked helplessly, hanging over his shoulders, as I felt the climax building again, but faster and more intense than before. I began to moan involuntarily as I got closer to release. Trevor tried to cover my mouth with one hand, but my moans only grew louder. I couldn't help myself. As he circled my clit with his tongue, my legs began to buck, and I knew an explosion was coming. Just as I went to scream, Trevor quickly shoved my panties in my mouth, muffling the sound of my release as I jerked and spasmed for what felt like a full minute, or maybe a lifetime of pleasure. When my orgasm subsided, Trevor planted a tiny kiss on my outer lips, 
which caused an aftershock of pleasure. He emerged from beneath my skirt, wiping his mouth with his pocket square, looking quite pleased with himself. He turned and walked away. And to my horror, I was sure he was leaving to return to the party without saying a word. But he stopped and picked something up from the floor and held it out to me. It was one of my stilettos. I apparently kicked it off during the biggest orgasm of my life. While trying to thank him for the shoe, I realized my panties were still in my mouth. I reached to remove them, and he stopped me, pulling my hand away. No, no, he admonished as he slowly pulled the panties from between my lips. These are mine now. He placed them in his pocket. You are mine now. Those words made my knees buckle again. But I managed to keep my balance. Trevor Edwards was right. I was his. I'd known it from the moment he looked at me in his study. I thought I had ruined everything with that outburst, but it didn't matter. I was his. And I knew there was nothing I could do about it. Trevor. I couldn't believe what I'd just done. I'd been looking forward to this gallery opening for months and disappeared down a side corridor to gorge myself on the sweet nectar that flowed from the flower of Gaia Wesley. As my business expands and takes me further away from my passion, I usually relish any opportunity I can get to immerse myself in the more creative aspects of the art industry. It would seem now that I have a new passion in which to immerse myself. That passion was standing 30 feet away, engaged in conversation with Victoria and one of my junior executives. I could think of nothing else as I watched her. Her long chestnut hair fell in waves over her shoulder and down her back. She tried to tame it as best she could, but it still had a freshly fucked tousle to it and her face was still flushed from the massive orgasm I'd just given her with my tongue. Her dress was slightly wrinkled, and she squirmed uncomfortably as, only she and I knew, she was no longer wearing panties. They resided in my pocket, where I was gently stroking the lace, reliving inhaling her intoxicating scent and tasting her petal-soft skin. I didn't like watching her talk to other men. I certainly didn't like the way this little punk was looking at her. His eyes roved over every inch of her body. My body. A wave of anger began to build and crest as I started to make my way to the trio. Just before I reached them, Mr. Junior Executive, who'd I'd planned to promote to the London office on Monday, was spared my wrath by none other than my Eloise. She grabbed Gaia by the hand and led her over to the chocolate fountain, where I watched with an overwhelming feeling of pride and passion. As Gaia, Eloise, and Liam spent the next few minutes making elaborate confectionery creations before dousing them in chocolate. They'd have stomach aches tomorrow, but for now, I enjoyed seeing them happy again. I'd never seen my children so comfortable and so at ease with someone they'd just met. Gaia's face was a mask of pure joy. She wasn't humoring the children or just playing along for my sake. It would seem as if there was no place in the world she'd rather be at that moment than stacking bits of bananas, strawberries, and marshmallows on skewers and drowning them in a river of chocolate. My entire body ached with longing. And I didn't think I could wait any longer to have her. But then Liam pretended to shoot her with imaginary spider webs. Her eyes went wide. She clasped the back of her hand to her forehead and staggered backward, collapsing into a nearby chair. Her body went limp and her head lulled to the side, eyes closed. Liam gasped with shock. And when he and Eloise crept closer to investigate... She sprang to life, scooping them up and tickling them until they squealed with laughter. In one of the most important events on the social calendar, 
anyone else in her position would have been networking making contacts, and trying to secure internships and jobs after graduation. But Gaia Wesley instead chose to focus on making my children laugh. She was laughing as well. A deep, penetrating laugh that somehow filled my soul and brightened the room. She caught my eye at that moment. And in that perfect moment, the most beautiful woman in the world was holding my laughing children, smiling, and had just offered me the only thing in the world my billions of dollars couldn't buy. And the one thing that I wanted. I wouldn't wait any longer to claim it. I strode over to the dessert table, turned Liam and Eloise to face me, and crouched down to get to their eye level. Time to go, you two. I think you've had enough candy and it's getting close to bedtime. For all of us. I looked at Gaia, and she looked down, blushing. Aw, Daddy, we were having fun with Gaia, whined Liam. Yeah, chimed Eloise. We want to stay with Gaia. Well, I whispered, what if I told you Gaia was coming home with us? You are? Eloise looked into Gaia's face, her eyes full of hope. Our eyes met, and her sparkling blue eyes told me, Everything I wanted to hear. Yes. Yes, I am. Gaia. The ride home from the gallery was something like a dream. I couldn't believe that I had met this man a mere two days ago. And not only was I falling for him, but also his adorable children, who were at this moment fast asleep with their heads in my lap the victims of a massive sugar crash. Their father sat next to me, gripping my hand. Our fingers interlocked while furiously texting with his other hand. How were you able to leave the gallery in the middle of the party? Weren't you supposed to make a speech or say goodbye or, darling, I can do whatever I want? Besides, I have more pressing matters to attend to. He lifted our interlocked hands and kissed mine before returning to his phone. My heart skipped a beat when he called me darling. It's a beautiful space. When Professor Swenson offered me the ticket to the gallery opening, I jumped at the chance to see it. I had no idea it was yours. Would you have stayed away if you'd known? Well, I started nervously. We were having a good time. And now I was going to ruin it again. I just assumed... After the first time we met, you would never want to see me again. After the first time we met, I was afraid I'd never see you again. Wait. His brow furrowed. Did you say Victoria invited you to the opening? Yes. Sometimes Professor Swenson has many competitions between her grad students, with the prize being a ticket to a coveted event. Movie premieres, gallery openings, book releases... This time, I won. I squeezed his hand. He smiled at me, but seemed deep in thought before laughing to himself. I think we all won tonight. Trevor. When we arrived at the townhouse, Liam and Eloise were still sleeping. I couldn't shake the thought that Victoria had orchestrated the events of the past three days. She was Olivia's best friend, and the three of us started PAX together. My wife made her closest friend promise to always look after us. She left PAX when Olivia left us, saying she couldn't bear the thought of the place without her there. But she remained close to the children and me, keeping her promise to my wife. Vic tried setting me up more than once over the years. About the time when Mrs. Bast retired, she dropped the subject, much to my relief. Then, she dropped the little goddess in my lap. Not once, but twice. Gaia was carefully unbuckling the children's seatbelts as I watched adoringly. Then, she followed as Frederick and I carried them inside. I realized that Victoria's plan worked like a charm. Liam woke up just long enough to be helped in two superhero pajamas and Eloise insisted on sleeping in what she called her princess dress. 
They had their own rooms, of course, but since Mrs. Bost left, Liam had taken to sleeping in the spare bed in Eloise's room to protect her, he insisted. Kaya, will you be here when we wake up tomorrow? Eloise's green eyes blinked lazily, still heavy with exhaustion as she waited for a response. Gaia looked at me, and I nodded. If I had my way, she would never leave us again. Yes, Eloise, I'll be here when you wake up tomorrow. Oh, good. She yawned lazily, closed her eyes, then opened them again. Gaia, do you like waffles with chocolate chips? I love waffles with chocolate chips. Oh, good. Gaia, she continued with a sleepy yawn. All right, bug, it's time for you to go to sleep. I bent over and kissed her forehead. You can ask Gaia all of the questions you want tomorrow. Okay, Daddy. Good night, Gaia. See you when I wake up tomorrow. Good night, Eloise. Gaia and I said in unison. It felt so comfortable. So natural. We closed the door to the nursery and I rounded on her. A grin spreading across my face. First things first. I bent down, picked her up, tossed her over my shoulder in a fireman's lift, and carried her down the hall like a Viking sacking a conquered village. This was the moment I'd waited for since I saw her in that dress. If I was honest with myself, I wanted her since the moment she stepped into my office. She looked nothing like the demure librarian type that timidly shuffled into my office looking for a job. The woman who stood before me was the image of the wild, untamed spirit I glimpsed as she was giving me a tongue lashing before storming out of my house two days ago. Her hair tumbled over her shoulders and down her back in chocolate-hued waves. Gone were the dark-rimmed glasses that, while they made me rock hard, they hid the long, thick, dark lashes that framed her iridescent, sapphire-colored eyes and made them somehow brighter by contrast. She stared at me in a little black dress that hugged her small breasts and waist before flaring into a many-layered tulle skirt, like a ballerina. She towered in what couldn't have been less than four-inch black stilettos. It was like Edward Degas and Gustav Klimt joined forces to paint a goddess. My little goddess. My first thought when I had her to myself was to rip her out of that dress, bend her over, grab handfuls of those shiny auburn locks, and slide myself into her waiting pussy over and over again, until she collapsed with paroxysms of pleasure. I wanted her in every way I could get her. But this was my first time with her. She deserved to be worshipped like a deity. There would be plenty of time for hard fucking as I planned to never let her out of my sight again. Her little body was so tight and eager, silently screaming to be touched. I knew that if I kissed her, I would never stop. Her first time with me needed to be special, gentle and loving, not a quick fuck against the wall of a public place. So instead, I gave her a tongue lashing of my own. I couldn't stop thinking about the taste of her, the fragrant heat emanating from between her thighs, the feeling of her bucking and jerking as I explored every inch of her nether regions with my tongue. One last thought raced through my mind as I strode the length of the corridor, with the little goddess slung over my shoulder like a pirate's treasure. If Miss Gaia Wesley thought she'd experienced pleasure in that secluded corridor of the art gallery, she hadn't seen anything yet. Gaia. My body burned with anticipation. Every square inch of flesh tingled with every stride Trevor made down the long corridor. I had no idea where he was taking me. But I knew I was desperate to feel his hands all over me again. He finally stopped at the door of the master suite and pushed it open to reveal the largest bedroom I'd ever seen, though my view was upside down. 
I thought he was headed for the massive bed when he made a left into a slightly smaller room and carefully set me down on a large chaise in a bathroom, but didn't resemble any bathroom I'd ever seen. It was stark white with pops of color in forms of rugs, pillows, flowers, and towels. The walls were decorated with framed Van Gogh sketches. I returned my attention to Trevor as I felt his strong hands caressing me. He had begun to undress me slowly. He removed my shoes one at a time, gently kissing the tender red indentation across the top of my foot, caused by the stress of wearing four-inch heels for hours, and massaging away the soreness. He leaned over my prone figure and grabbed the spaghetti straps of my dress and began to pull them over my shoulders. I watched him devour my body with his eyes. He growled hungrily as he pulled the dress over my chest, exposing my small breasts. He whipped the dress down the rest of my body and over his shoulder in a swift motion, leaving me naked and vulnerable, served to him on a platter. Fuck, you're beautiful, he moaned. I'm going to make love to you now, and when I do, you will really be mine. Is that what you want? I nodded hungrily. I never wanted anything more in my life. I wanted to belong to Trevor Edwards. I wanted to give him everything. Good, he growled as he hoisted my nude form into his arms so quickly that I squealed. Because I can't wait another second. In an instant, I felt myself being lowered onto his bed. He leaned over me with his face hovering inches from mine. My beautiful little goddess, he said before closing the distance between our mouths. I kissed him hungrily, exploring his mouth with my tongue. He lowered the full weight of his body on mine. As I writhed and squirmed under the fullness of him, feeling the pressure of the large bulge in his pants against my thigh, as my hands reached down to his belt buckle, he lifted his weight, still kissing me like a man possessed and I slid the belt out of its loops and tossed it aside. I made short work of his button and zipper and slid my hand down his boxer briefs. What's wrong? Trevor asked, a small look of concern on his face. I had just become aware that I'd stopped kissing him and must have looked a little frightened. It's so big, I whispered. He laughed and kissed me again. For you, my love, it's the perfect size. He raised himself up and stood beside the bed and began to unbutton his shirt. I sprang to my knees to face him, furiously kissing him again and clawing at his trousers. His cock sprang forth as his boxer sank to the floor, and my jaw dropped. It was the biggest penis I'd ever seen. In school, I must have sketched dozens of naked men with penises of all sizes in varying states of arousal, but never one like Trevor's. I was able to stack both hands around with inches of shaft left over, topped with a massive head from which a thick, clear, sticky fluid dribbled. I instinctively leaned over and lapped up the clear juice and heard Trevor groan with pleasure. I began to lick around the head of his big, beautiful cock, and his moans increased. Yes, my little goddess, he moaned. Your mouth feels so good. Encouraged by his words, I enclosed the entire head in my mouth and began to work my way down his massive shaft, moving my head back and forth, taking in more and more as the tip traveled further and further towards the back of my throat. He entangled his large fingers in my hair, guiding my face closer and closer to the base of his manhood, moaning my name and the word yes. Without warning, he pushed me down on the bed and parted my legs, he climbed on top of me, and I could feel the flared tip of his erection pressing against the opening between my legs. He looked into my eyes, and I could feel the question burning in his eyes. I drew in a deep breath and nodded once, before feeling Trevor Edwards pressing into me slowly. I closed my eyes, relishing the exquisite mix of pain and pleasure. I felt a tear slowly slide down the side of my face, immediately followed by Trevor's lips kissing it away and whispering in my ear, after tonight, 
No pain, my love. Only pleasure. I felt him withdraw. I was terrified that he would stop himself again as he did at the party, but instead, Trevor called my name. And when I turned to look into his eyes, only inches from mine, he said the three words I'd longed to hear since I first left his townhouse. With a final thrust, he claimed my heart and my soul. As he began to move himself in and out of me rhythmically, I felt the pain give way to waves of pleasure. I wrapped my legs around his waist and began rocking my hips into his, taking more of him inside me with each thrust. It wasn't long before I'd taken the fullness of Trevor Edwards, and his pace quickened as he began slamming into me, stimulating my most sensitive place every time his hips crashed into mine. I started moaning again, and I knew what was coming was possibly stronger than what I experienced balanced atop Trevor's shoulders, leaning against the wall of the gallery. Go ahead and scream as loud as you want, baby, he growled. His voice rumbled in my ear sent me over the edge, and I succumbed to the first wave of an earth-shattering climax. Moments later, I felt my lover's entire body clench as he roared, filling me with his release. We rocked and shuddered together for what felt like a blissful eternity, our mouths hungrily exploring each other's, as though we'd never be satisfied. When the last surges of titillation subsided, Trevor rolled to the side slowly, sliding himself out of me, stimulating aftershocks which caused my whole body to twitch with delight. My entire body was buzzing, but I was exhausted. I had never felt this amazing in my life. But it wasn't only the sex. Trevor, I said for the first time. He turned his face towards me, apparently delighted to hear me say his name. I love you too. Gaia. He grinned wickedly before climbing on top of me and kissing me again. I could feel him harden against my thigh. He pressed himself into me again, and this time, the sensation was only pleasure. He held me close to him, rolled onto his back, and suddenly I was on top of him. His strong hands guided my hips up and down the length of his shaft. I set my own rhythm, rising and falling onto him, and he began to explore my body with his hands. He cupped my breasts with his hands, gently pinching and caressing my tender nipples. He ran his fingers through my hair, before trailing his fingers down my waist and rubbing my clit with his thumb. My face contorted with pleasure, and I began to moan. So beautiful, he groaned, before digging his fingers into either side of my hips and slamming me down on his while he experienced his second climax of the evening. I quickly followed, screaming in ecstasy while grinding myself into his hips, catching everything his body had to give me. I collapsed onto his chest and slid to his side to nestle myself into the crook of his arm as he caressed my naked body with his fingertips, sending little shockwaves of pleasure through every inch of my flesh. So I began panting heavily, even more exhausted than before, which I didn't think was possible. I guess I'm not getting the nanny job. He smiled and replied, no, I think not. After the way you behaved in that interview, I'll have to remember to punish you for speaking to me that way. He playfully swatted my behind with his hand. Please do. I smiled and kissed him on the nose. Actually, I was thinking of a different position for you. If you're interested. I am, I purred. Sure that he was referring to something with me on all fours, my face buried in a pillow to muffle my screams. To my surprise, he rose from the bed and I watched his chiseled behind and rippled back muscles cross to the door, open it, and return with a small silver tray I was sure wasn't there when we came in, although I was hanging upside down at the time. Chocolate chip waffles? I inquired. I suddenly realized I was also starving. Not this time. He wore his signature dimpled grin that left me weak. 
He lifted the lid to reveal a small wooden display, which held the most beautiful ring I'd ever seen. It was a four-carat pear-shaped emerald ring, flanked by two one-carat emeralds and set in platinum. Is this? The rest of the sentence got lost in my throat, afraid if I spoke the words it wouldn't be true. It is. If you'll have us. The laughter was gone from his face. He was serious. After a long pause, he continued, You see, the three emeralds represent you and Liam and Eloise. I sighed. And their sparkling green eyes, I continued to myself, unable to take my eyes off of the ring. You didn't strike me as a girl who'd want a giant diamond. But if you don't like it, we could... How could I not like it? Aside from Trevor being right about me never wanting a diamond engagement ring, this was the single most perfect gift anyone had ever given me. Both the ring and what it symbolized. Yes, I whispered. I felt the hot tears stinging my eyes as he slipped the ring on my finger, a perfect fit. But how? When? His mischievous grin returned. This was what he was texting about on the way home. He somehow managed to design and commission a -a one-of-a-kind ring and have it delivered in mere hours. I would move mountains for my little goddess, he said, while pulling me back into the crook of his arm, where he covered us in a thick duvet and resumed lightly caressing my skin with his fingertips. And this is only the beginning. Trevor, we barely know each other, I whispered, and stroked his cheek with the hand now bearing the one-of-a-kind emerald ring. Gaia. He covered my hand with his own and moved it to his lips. I'm a man who knows how to spot a work of art. It's made me very wealthy. There is no way I'm letting a priceless treasure like you slip through my fingers. I smiled, and my eyes sparkled with tears. I'm in no rush, he continued. We can spend all the time you need getting to know each other, and when you're ready, you can make me the luckiest man in the world. What about Liam and Eloise? I asked. I think Liam and Eloise will be very happy with this arrangement. He chuckled before leaning forward and kissing me. I don't want them to feel like I'm replacing their mother. Trevor's smile dropped at my serious expression, and he pulled me into his arms. You could never replace Olivia because you are not Olivia. You are Gaia Wesley, the woman who captured the heart of a sad man and his two children, who didn't know what was missing in their lives until she strolled through the doors of their townhouse. I promise, he brought my hand to his lips again. I will spend the rest of our lives showing you just how special you are. Okay. Yeah? He raised his eyebrows in question. Yeah, I nodded and kissed him. Good. He folded me into his arms and kissed me, before covering us with the duvet. Now, we should get some sleep. In a few hours, Eloise is going to come into this room looking for chocolate chip waffles, and you're going to need to be well rested. Does that mean you will actually let me sleep, Trevor Edwards? I shot him a wicked grin. No promises, Gaia Wesley. The End This has been The Art of Stealing His Heart by Lucy Eden. Read for you by Ramona Master. Welcome back. Welcome back, lady listeners. So like I said, make sure you check out everything by Lucy Eden. We'll have it all done in the show notes. I know it was a lot we were throwing at you at one time. But thank you so much to Lucy Eden for bringing us the art of stealing his heart. Um, She's just such a great person. I'm so glad to have her on the podcast and to know her and just to be able to read and love her books. So this is great. Oh, up next. Let's see. Up next. Oh, we have Abby Knox on the podcast. I know. She's another one where this will be. Oh, no, wait. I'm sorry. I got my weeks mixed up. I'm so sorry. Dakota Rebels next. (laughs) But I'm super excited about her. She is so freaking sweet. 
we talked for a while about this one and um, I'm just so glad she finally was able to work it out and we got her on the podcast. Um, the book she's bringing us is called Out of Left Field and I love a good sports romance. So she'll be with us next week. Right. But I, and do we have anything we needed to add? Be on the lookout for Alexa Riley books. Do that. Yeah, I think he's so. all in. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. That'll be up next. All right. All right. Tell him what to do. Fuck your day up. Make sure your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Bye. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. You could take a look in a book that's fine. Or you could sit back, relax, and unwind. And read me romance. Read, read me romance.